you very much for your attendance. I know this is the last day of the conference, but I really appreciate that you all are here. Um, my name is Kelly Olson. Um, as you can see, that's my disclaimer slide. However, um, it wasn't filled out properly. I'm what they call a rebel speaker, and I didn't fill it out properly. So I am the director of research and development for a company called Neuroscience. And so um, I do work for them, and uh, so that's my disclosure. Uh, the other thing is, too, I just wanted to make mention to everyone, if you have any questions or would like to speak uh, to me after the lecture, I will be moderating this session. So I won't be available till about 3.30, but I will have a representative um, out at the back, um, outside the, the room, should you have any questions. So please feel free to step out and talk to that gentleman. His name is Ross. So I'm not a big fan of being up on the podium, so if I do walk around a little bit, I hope you can all still uh, follow what I'm saying. Dr. Stewart did that the other day, and I thought that was really neat. It gets very imposing when you're up here on this, uh, on this stage. So, so we'll get started. So what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is estrogen and serotonin connections. And a little bit will be on the implications of testing. However, I don't want to focus a lot on that and can do so after the, uh, after the lecture is finished. So please keep any questions that you have about testing in particular. Um, keep that and then find me after and we can talk directly. So these are the objectives um, that I want to cover today. And the first one being connections, um, neurotransmitters and hormones. This conference is, is an amazing um, wealth of information on hormones. But what I'm finding is, is that we're not making the connections to neurotransmitters and other biomarkers that perhaps we could. And the reason why I say that this is uh, extremely important is because how many of you know that when you have a hormonal issue, many times, if not all the time, it's accompanied with behavioral problems, mood issues, um, psychiatric conditions such as that. So we can't really have one without the other. And as you'll see in my subsequent slides, that these systems interact with one another. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Serotonin and estrogen connections. Again, many of you are familiar with that, but my hope this afternoon is that I'll shed some more light on things. I'll get a little deeper into those connections and ways that you can manipulate those systems to help your patients. And then finally, a different way of thinking. I'll sort of tie everything together. Um, and again, give you something perhaps to uh, apply in your clinic on Monday morning. So as I mentioned, this is a uh, picture that we've put together to show the three systems that I alluded to a few moments ago. Now, I did some, I have a PhD in pharmacology and therapeutics, and I worked, my focus was in Alzheimer's disease. So the brain is my organ of choice. But when I was taking medical school classes, we learned a lot of these, these systems, these three systems in particular, as a separate entity. And I found that to be a, quite a travesty because, in fact, these systems, as you well know when you see your patients, they work very, very well together, um, both in sickness and in health. And so we see here that these systems, again, you can't have one functioning without the other. And again, I put this at the bottom, operating in sickness and in health. So what I'll touch on today is the neural side of things as well as the hormonal, but I won't necessarily talk about the immune system. Again, that is something that I would love to discuss with you at length at another time, but for this particular talk, we'll just focus on the neuro and the endo side. I wanted to read to you a quote. This was from 2008, just to kind of get your feet wet as to why this is so important and why we, uh, we want to study more in depth the neuroendo connections. A system of shared ligands and receptors comprises what's known as a chemical language that makes possible a complex, coherent response to a stressor at all levels of human physiology. So that's quite the statement. Now, it's a very global statement, but it also has some poignant um, specifics as well, one of them being chemical, chemical language. Now, you know yourself when you order up labs for your patient, 
everything is a chemical language. Whether that be lipids, a lipid panel, whether that be um, a CRP, uh, blood counts, blood le um, red blood cells, white blood cell counts, etc. It's all part of a chemical language, now either directly or indirectly. And I thought this quote was very re relevant to that. Another thing I wanted to point out, and what I love about the speakers that I've heard this weekend, uh, this week and this weekend, is a lot of it is based on the literature. And now, in my capacity as a research director, I won't do anything unless there's research involved. So whether that be studying the literature that's already available or um, promoting or, or um, pushing the science forward, for lack of a better way to describe it, in the literature myself. And so I wanted to bring this up to you as well. In this particular paper, this was in 2001, and here are some of the points to this, this article. There is increasing scientific attention to the modulation of the neuroendocrine system by fluctuating gonadal hormones. And secondly, the loss of modulating effects of estrogen and progesterone may underlie the development of perimenopausal mood disorders in vulnerable women. So there's a lot to be said in those two statements from this particular article. Um, one in, that I really wanted to point out to you is the bottom one here. And again, I'm going to highlight this word, in vulnerable women. You'll see as I go through this talk what I mean by vulnerable women. There's definitely um, a way to describe that, both medically as well as, um, well, scientifically as well as medically, and you'll see that as we move forward. So how does the brain control or influence hormones? Again, many of you are very familiar with hormones. You um, probably use HRT or bioidenticals in your clinics. But now I want to take a step back and look at the brain control of these hormones. 